parts of it, most affected of all were the briefed. Nancy had always known that Danny Soar, her high school sweetheart, wanted to be a firefighter. Nancy was Italian-American. Danny was Irish-American. Not long before 9-11, one of Danny's oldest and closest colleagues, Harry Ford, had died and he had invited Nancy to attend the funeral, not least because a firefighter's funeral was quite an event, he'd said. Danny was very moved by Harry's death and gave Nancy instructions that, should he ever die in the line of duty, he wanted a closed coffin. Nancy had said there wouldn't be anywhere big enough to hold a funeral for Danny, because he was widely known and popular, but he specified the Marine Park funeral home, and she promised. Looking back, she wondered, did he know? Danny was a strong man, not a bully, who made everything seem like it would be okay, especially for Nancy and for his daughter, Brianna, who was two years old and about to start nursery on the morning of 9-11, but never arrived there. Engine 216 got the call, the run, as they would say, and set off to the scene, where they were directed to assemble at the command post inside the South Tower. The captain, Paul Conlon, who was leading them, described how they had about 200 yards to cover. Debris was falling and people were jumping as they surveyed the scene. Danny said something like, let's make this quick. So they set off together in a diagonal line when Danny was hit. As Nancy recently told me, she came out of the sky like a torpedo. Was struck. A woman had jumped or fallen and landed on Danny. It was a freak accident, made all the more unlikely by the fact that few victims jumped or fell from the South Tower. The news study only observed three people falling from the South Tower, one at 9.30, about the time Danny was hit. His colleagues reacted quickly and carried him to the shelter of some nearby scaffolding. A photographer captured the moment they lifted him, which must have been seconds after he was struck. He was taken by ambulance and treated by a doctor and paramedics who soon realized he was not viable. Two of Danny's closest friends and colleagues traveled with him to Bellevue Hospital. They kept yelling his name. The medic with them knew Danny's neck was broken because of the way his head moved every time they hit a bump. Please stop staring at him. He told Danny's friends. You're going to burn this image into your head. I want you to remember a better image. Nancy got home that morning to find a voicemail message from Danny. Hey babe, it's me. Just want to tell you that everything's okay. I'll talk to you later. I love you. Not long afterwards, she received a phone call from the fire department, telling her that Danny had been hurt and they were coming to take her to him. She knew then, in her heart, that he was dead. At the hospital, the captain said, I am so sorry, Nancy. It was like an out-of-body experience, she told me. Thinking of Brianna, she said, who's going to walk her down the aisle? They tried to stop her seeing Danny, but she insisted, and so she was taken to him, and saw his forehead cracked in half and his cheek and nose broken. He is going to be so mad that he broke his nose, she kept thinking. She was determined to keep her composure and not throw herself on the floor. She kissed him and whispered to him and walked out of the room. She had to go home now, she said, and do the laundry. Later that night she learned how Danny had died, and all she could remember thinking was, how horrendous for that poor person. What had been going through their mind before they jumped or fell? How horrific for those people up there to have to choose. Danny did not choose, but they had to. Richard Drew told me he liked to think of the falling man as the photographic equivalent of the tomb of the unknown soldier, representing all those who had died by jumping or falling. The man in the picture has been identified by some as Jonathan Brilly, a 43-year-old African-American who worked at the windows on the World Restaurant on the top two floors of the North Tower, right above the offices of Cantor Fitzgerald. Brilly came from a religious family who were also entertainers. His sister, 
Gwendolyn was an actress and his brother, Alex, was one of the village people, the Gee. Gwendolyn told me that Jonathan was a talented musician, working at the time of his death as a sound and video technician at the restaurant. The family had felt some relief when his body was found soon after 9-11. His younger brother, a police officer, had gone to identify him and had taken a shoe from Jonathan's foot as a keepsake. Perhaps because the falling man's feet and shoes were visible in Drew's photograph, a photographer had turned up once at the Brilly family home in Mount Vernon, asking to photograph the shoe. The family had a body that was intact, and so far as Gwendolyn was concerned that it meant her brother could not be the falling man, even if the photograph had reminded her of him when she first saw it. The truth is, that can't be him, but if some people find comfort in believing it is him, then, no, I am not going to challenge that, she said. She knew there were people who looked upon the act of jumping as suicide, and an unforgivable sin before God, but that was not the way she believed her God showed his love. Who were we to judge how anyone would react in that inferno? Nobody should feel any shame, she said. Those people were getting out of that situation as best they could. They were falling into the arms of God, they really were.